and it's idling. What about the lights? Nothing? Yeah. <laughs> now, before we get into the actual detailing, it's really important to have some perspective as to what was going on in the United States when this car was built, meaning 1935. The United States at the time was deeply entrenched in the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world. It lasted from 1929 all the way to 1939, so for 10 years. So clearly not a great time to come out with a new model car. It all started after the stock market collapse, which crushed millions of investors and subsequently caused businesses to collapse and close. By 1933, 15 million Americans were unemployed and almost half of the United States banks had closed their doors due to panicked customers withdrawing their savings in what's called a bank run. Basically what happens is you freak out, you run to the bank, you take all your money out, but that actually collapses the banks. Now, with all that going on, Chrysler decided to launch an all new car from the ground up focused on the price conscious buyer to compete with Ford and Chevy, and they did just that. The 1935 Plymouth was the most advanced car in its price class, offering four-wheel hydraulic brakes, an independent handbrake, full pressure engine lubrication, new stylish interior coachwork, and a detuned six-cylinder engine with 82 horse that could get 26 and a half miles per gallon to conserve as much fuel as possible. A base model cost roughly 500 ish dollars in 1935 and could go up based on the trim levels you chose at the dealership. Oh, by the way, if you wanted the Plymouth, meaning that ship emblem on the front of your car, that was gonna cost you $3.50. Now, I found this car on autotempest.com where you can search all the major online marketplaces at the same time from one website. Super simple. Thank you to them for sponsoring this episode. I'll have much more on this later. When I arrived, I met with Daniel and his father to see Sleeping Beauty nice after nice 40 nice years. You. I'm Larry. Lenny. All hey. right. So, where's this car? It's a good start when the door works. Usually, I'm like, <laughs> look at this. <laughs> Incredible. Now, how long has it been sitting here? Probably since 83 or 85. We all used to play in the car. We used to take the keys from inside. We used to get in the interior, we used to play in it, crawl all over it. It's a miracle that all the parts are still there, the hood ornament, nothing's been taken or damaged or dented up in any way. So we really want to get the car out into the light of day. Um, it's been in the garage for 40 years. And what's most important to us is getting us into the hands of an enthusiast or a collector, somebody that's really, really going to appreciate the car. Hopefully if it runs and drives, somebody can get this back on the road and really enjoy it. All right, you guys ready to roll up your sleeves and get this thing out? <laughs> Very. <laughs> so step one is just unearthing it from the years of junk and getting it back to the studio. It's going, it's going. With the car now inside and under the lights, I called my buddy and fix anything guru, Ted, to see if we can get this thing to turn over. You guys remember Ted, he had the doodle bug, we pulled it out of the woods. Somehow he got that thing running. This guy can start just about anything. Naturally, he rolled up in his 1939 GMC truck. That thing is super cool. And he got his tools, came inside, and the first thing he did was just blow out the years of junk that was surrounding the spark plug area just in case it fell in okay. when he took the spark plugs out. We don't want anything going into the cylinders at this point. With the rusty plugs now out, he poured some tranny fluid in to help lubricate the cylinder if it actually starts up. Before he did that, we used a Milwaukee inspection probe tool to see if there's any heavy rust or anything that needed to be an issue or, or addressed. So he didn't see anything. I was super optimistic. Then we reinstalled the plugs and just let it soak for a week. He's going to be back to help me start this in a couple of days. Make sure you stay tuned for the startup. Absolutely insane. What am I hearing? Compression. Really? What? This thing will run. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we'll get it running. <laughs> 
So a lot of you have asked, how are you finding these cars? And the way I'm doing it is through autotempest.com. I cast a super wide net to find a very specific car. And they basically take all of that and crunch it down into one website. It is super cool. This one in particular is a 1935 Plymouth. Now that is very particular, but check this one out over here. This Stanley Steamer 1911. So what happens is when I'm using Auto Tempest, I put in a particular radius, let's say like 100 miles. I think that's reasonable for me to drive and come back in one day. You can do nationwide, you can do whatever you want. Then I put in the specific car and then maybe the price and that sort of thing. And it'll just grind it all the way down and you'll find all these listings, everything from eBay, cars.com, true car, et cetera, down to things like Facebook and Craigslist. That's where they'll send you links. And I find a lot of the cars that you see in our episodes at Auto Tempest com it is a great place to find used cars i'll put a link down below now back to the episode with oil now marinating in the cylinders i first started by covering up the roof to avoid water from pouring in during the upcoming power wash then i vacuumed and just removed all the junk from the interior to try to reduce the awful smell inside the car and what was just stinking up the studio Clearly this has been a home for rodents for 40 years or so, causing the carpets and the floors to be disintegrating and just covered in urine, it was really gross. Next, I put my sodium chloride tablet inside for safety before I went too much further. With the doors now closed and the tablet doing its work, I power washed the car that likely hasn't been fully washed in about 40 years for sure, but I'd argue it's 70 plus years before it got a full or thorough washing like this one here. So enjoy. For the paint, I used Brute and Boost in the foam gun. I let it soak for a few minutes before scrubbing with a blue wash towel and brush. Whenever I'm doing a car like this, I always think about who was the last guy to touch this? Who was the last guy to wash it? Where was he? What was he doing? Did he wash it to go out to a, you know, a party or something? Or did he go to work? Or what was really going on? What was the time for this? This, if the metal could talk on this, I can only imagine what was going on. So these cars are not just, hey, let's clean it and make a fun video. They actually mean something because it's like, it's just part of history. I find these very, very cool. Anyways, after my zoning out and washing and dreaming about who touched it or whatever, bright and early the next day, after drying the paint and removing the tablet, I focused on the sensitive interior. In this case, because it's so old, normal tools and normal techniques, lots of hot water extractors, stiff bristle brushes, power drills, all that stuff is appropriate on new stuff. It's not gonna be super appropriate here. And you're gonna need to start off really, really slow and delicate with your approach until the material sort of dictates that the cleaning method is working great and it's not damaging the surface in the process. As you become more comfortable, you can become more aggressive. That's what we had to do here. So step one is pretty simple, vacuum the area. But in that process, if you're seeing the material start to disintegrate, obviously stop. There's no way you're going to be able to use aggressive chemicals or mechanical action at that point. However, be sure that the vacuum nozzle isn't sharp itself or has burrs on it from like jamming it underneath a seat and denting it. This may catch some of the fibers on older cloth. I know that sounds crazy, but it's actually something that happens on older material. So what I like to do when I'm working on super old interiors is to take my nozzle and rub it on the floor, basically using it as sandpaper or use actual sandpaper to deburr the plastic. I know that sounds ridiculous and it is kind of ridiculous until you pull or tear the surface of a vintage seat. Believe me, I've been there. As you can see, the seats are pretty dirty, but it's really hard to know what kind of stain it is. So we'll have to play it safe for now. If the material holds up, meaning it's strong, we can use more aggressive methods. I'll have a full length video on the step-by-step -step process for super sensitive interiors coming out on the studio channel very soon. With the seat bottom now out of the car, the underneath is of course loaded with mouse residue, acorns, nest, poop, etc. All the usual stuff. And because of that, I started to revacuum again just because it, it was really, the smell was horrific.
Step one with the seats is to first lightly mist the material with shag, so it sort of just like floats on top of the surface, barely getting some cleaner and moisture into the fibers. If it's all good and everything feels good, then you can continue on. On the stains and the marks, if they look like they're caused from oil, which this one does right here, I use Titan 12 degreaser as a spot cleaner instead of shag on this specific spot. Next, I soaked a microfiber towel in hot water, then squeezed out the water so it was damp, not wet, that's very important, then laid it on one side of the seat and allowed the warm temperature and the shag to do its work gently together while lightly tamping with a tamping brush. Afterwards, I replaced the hot damp towel with a dry absorbing terry cloth or something similar. Then I lightly tamped to transfer any moisture that was left in that stain area and that seat area and then pulls it up and sticks to the white towel. It's a very slow process, but it's incredibly gentle. In our case, the next step up the aggression ladder would be to steam vac because it's incredibly delicate, but it also puts down very little water, which is key here on super old cloth. After a few passes with the machine, you can see there's a difference from left to right now. It's pretty subtle, but it's there, and more importantly, it's now clean. If you weren't sure if we got anything out of the seats, check the reservoir tank after just a few passes. Disgusting. On the passenger side rear door, look at the darker stains around the door handle. Now my guess is this is from hand oil or grease from rolling the window up and rolling the window down. So I use Titan degreaser here and a larger two tier interior scrub brush as I build more confidence with the integrity of the material. This time around, I used the steam machine with the head wrapped in a microfiber towel to minimize the aggressiveness on the material, but increase the cleaning power of the degreaser. Look at the yellow towel when I was done, plus it wasn't super wet either, so it was a win-win. With more and more confidence in the material and my techniques becoming more aggressive, the seat back was done with steam, air diffuser, and then steam back, and it held up great. The 50-50 here was significant. Afterwards, just like all the other fibers, I covered it in Restore to kill any bacteria and associated smells. Now, just about the time I was feeling really confident in the material on the back seat on the driver's side, I hit it with the air diffuser and the moldy pieces just disintegrated. So I was brought back down to reality pretty quickly. All right, guys, I'm behind the camera now, and this is a perfect example of sort of getting uh, too comfortable. So the seat back right here, very, very strong. So I could hit it with the air diffuser. I could be a little more aggressive, no problem. I kept using this technique on the side here, and I didn't realize but there's a hole right there. Obviously water's coming. You see that, you can see right through that little air pocket right there, boom. So clearly water's coming in, dripping down here. And then over time just became very moldy and crusty. Now this is almost, you hear that? It's like hard as a rock. So as soon as I hit that with the air diffuser, bang, it just exploded. So this is just another good example of not every panel in here is gonna react the same way. I could probably hit this section here Right around here with the air diffuser or a little more aggressive methods. Probably not right here. See a little mold going down there. Then when it comes to the front, I could probably be a little bit more aggressive. Maybe not right just here because it's a little, looks a little thin here, but the rest of it I could be pretty aggressive with. Same thing here. But if you see anything mold, there it is, bang. I gotta go easy here. This is water drippage. As soon as you hit this, the point of the story is you're gonna start with the least aggressive method possible. Uh, in that case, you can use the hot uh, pad there or the hot microfiber towel. If you have fancy tools like the steam machine and the steam vac, great. You can do a lot of things with it, but there's a lot of methods you can do that are not that complicated to work on this. But the end of the story or the bottom line, I would say, is just take your time. Think of it like archaeology. You're just trying to heat this up just a little bit, clean it, see what happens, then go the next method a little bit more aggressive, see what happens next, next, and you're gonna just, you know, sort of leapfrog until you get to a comfortable where you're like, okay, that's too much. Guess what? That right there, obviously too much, uh, but it's a great learning example.
Just about then, Ted, aka Dead Battery Guy on Instagram, make sure you support him. He rolled in with his new battery and of course a bag of tricks to get this relic started. Naturally, the water pump is frozen from what I understand is super rare on these cars, but the distributor cap on the other hand is super clean, so we were going in the right direction. Then he cleaned the points with a file, just like we did on the 190 SL that we got started after like 15 or 20 years of sitting in a basement. Anyways, we replaced the old battery, cleaned the cables for a better connection, then we tested to see if we had a spark. Nice bright spark. Next, he removed the air cleaner, lubed up the choke linkages, and then disconnected the fuel line from the old gas tank, and then replaced it with an external gas line that we call an IV bag. It's pretty cool. You can actually put gas in it, put it up as high as you can, and then have the new fresh gas flow into the carburetor. Super cool. After a few more attempts, we actually got it to turn over and smoke like crazy, but it wouldn't run by itself because the carburetor was clogged up. Hold so on. Ted disassembled it, he did his magic, and then we raised the gas tank even higher and put it on okay. my camera stand for better flow. That's cool. Then this happened. <laughs> And it's idling. Oh, wow, it's sweet. And the smoke is from the oil we put in the cylinders. I'm sure cylinders. after it runs a little bit, it'll it'll clear right out. I'm like, that's awesome. Right it's awesome. At this point, I knew that the car was running. I was really excited. I felt like I got a shot of B12. So I finished up the cleaning of the dashboard. I replaced the cushions and the before and after on the interior, it was pretty good. But more importantly, it was safe to get in. Next, with renewed enthusiasm, I worked on the 67-year-old paint with a foam pad and polish, and look at the difference with just a few quick passes. I nearly passed out. It was unbelievable. <laughs> now I'm bouncing off the wall, so whatever paint is actually left on the body of the car, that's going to get restored whether you like it or not. I was super, <laughs> I'm super jazzed at this point. The key here is just to blow out your pad more often, not only because it's single stage paint, but it's also oxidized and scratched up. So tons of junk is coming off. Just blow out the pad, put your headphones on and enjoy. By the end of day four, the paint and the interior looked really good, and the only thing left to do was to clean the absolutely disgusting windows with a scrub pad. Now, this is the biggest before and after, and it's not uncommon on uh, super old cars like this one. So once again, the glass steals the show. Before Daniel and his family arrived, I put mud tire dressing on the leaky, cracked Firestones because why not? I wanted it to look good. Then I cleaned the back tire and the white walls with the Kevin Brown trick of using Ammo Plum wheel cleaner and a dish scrubber on the white walls. It does a really great job. Lastly, I spray whacked Grandpa's Mason contractor sign, replaced it on the door, and she was ready for the family reveal.
Hey. Hi, Larry. Good to see you, man. Good to you too. Come on in. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Look at this thing. Wow. Amazing, oh my right? Oh God. <laughs> There's nobody living in it anymore. Wow. Yes. It looks pulled. safe in there now. So one of the cool things about this car is when you're rolling down the window, you can see here, see how it goes back yeah. and then down? See oh, yeah. Have you noticed that? That's so really what that is, is because there's no, um, you know, like in our cars, you hit a defroster when it gets cold, etc. This is why you, they, they allow the window to open up, right? Cracks open, so you have a defroster. But this one here was when you're driving and it starts to fog up, you would just open this just a little bit. Nowadays, we have the rain guards. Yeah. But back then, they did that. The other thing I, I found out is from Ted, who's a mechanic of these older cars, uh -huh. A lot of guys, you know, in the 30s and 40s, they would just smoke cigarettes. That was like a normal thing, right? right. So they would take their cigarette, flick it right there, and then be able to <laughs> just quickly do it without having to reach backwards and put it out. Kind of cool, right? Great project. <laughs> I think so. Your next 30 years are said for She right says now. that because I'm the one with garage space right now. Yeah. <laughs> With that, the 35 is looking for a new home and will be posted up online very soon. You'll be sure to find it and others on autotempest.com. I'll also put an email in the description below to reach out to Daniel and his family about his grandfather's Plymouth PJ sedan. Hopefully, you can get her back on the road and turn in heads real soon. And if you have a car and a story just like this one that needs a new lease on life, shoot me an email at larry at As always, thanks for watching and see you soon.